so it's live now we can start go ahead is it yes in facebook or uh, youtube all are everywhere you are live okay fine so good morning everyone as a part of our csir summer research training program activities coordinated by CSIR Northeast Institute of Science and Technology under the leadership of our Honorable Director Dr. G. Narahari Sastri. We have been started this program by the inaugural lecture of uh, our Honorable Director General Dr. Sekhar Simande. And as a part of that activity today, you know, uh, we are going to have a session on the you know, lectures uh, by you know, our research, uh, researchers on the COVID because uh, you know, we uh, we have been you know started testing uh, the COVID-19 here at CSI NIST about uh, a month back, and it was uh, inaugurated by the Honorable Health Minister of Assam, Dr. Himanta Biswas Sharma. You know, in in presence of several other uh, parliamentarians as well as you know ministers of Assam, and uh, in presence of our Honorable Director, sir. Dr. Zian Sastri, and uh, uh, you know uh, we have a team of COVID warrior, and today as a part of uh, this uh, COVID uh, warrior lecture series, <coughs> uh, different aspects related to COVID-19 will be presented, and uh, hopefully it will be quite interesting for all the participants. You know all the uh, presenters are research student of our Northeast Institute of Science and Technology, Jurhat, and they will describe about the detection techniques and a process uh, and uh, the process and progress of COVID-19 drugs and vaccine worldwide and how you know COVID-19 is uh, affecting on different age groups and what is the role of micronutrients to boost our immune system and so on. So there will be about seven, six lectures and uh, hope all of you will be enjoying. With this you know, short remark, uh, I would like to request uh, Mr. Prasujjo Dotto. He will giving the first lecture, first presentation of uh, this morning on COVID-19 detection techniques and approaches. So Mr. Prasujjo Dotto is a Senior Research Fellow at Biological Sciences and Technology Division, CSI and Office Institute of Science and Technology. Uh, he has been very much active, uh, you know, research student, not only in his research activities, but he's active uh, uh, guy overall. So with this very brief introduction, now I request Prasujja to go ahead with, with his presentation. Thank you. <clears throat> so very good morning to one and all. Welcome to the SRTP lecture series on COVID-19. I'd like to thank Director Sir Dr. G. Narahari Sastri Sir to give us this opportunity. And I would also like to thank Lucky Sega Sir for this brief introduction. So I'll be talking, uh, my lecture will be on detection techniques and approaches uh, for COVID-19. So I think uh, I'm audible. Yes. Okay. So let me start. Uh, Whether this slide is. Uh, so it's uh, slide is visible, I guess. No, 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 not yet. You have to share. Okay, and I'm I'm doing it. Is it visible? Yes, yes. Okay, thank you so much. So uh, the title of my talk is Detection Technique and Approaches for COVID-19. So first of all, uh, let's give a brief introduction about the COVID-19. So um, just one minute. Okay. Stop sharing, Corina. Yeah, I can't stop sharing. Share to open table. 
Is it coming? It is coming. It is safe to lie. It is again not coming. No, no. That's it. No, no. The mail is clear. Mail is. Mail to phone from. Now it is working. Just go ahead. Okay. Uh, so just giving a brief introduction. <clears throat> so COVID-19 is discovered in Hubei provinces in China on December 2019. So uh, well, COVID-19 has similarities. So it has 80% similarities with the SARS-CoV and 50% with the MERS-CoV and 96% with the bad coronavirus. So therefore, it is named as SARS-CoV-2. And uh, uh, as you can see that the all over world, there are 10.4 million people which are infected by this virus and already 5,000 uh, 5, deaths are already recorded. And in case of India, the active cases are more than 2 lakhs. So now what we are doing in CSI is, so we have a testing laboratory which is uh, open in 30th of May 2020. So the present capacity is 500 tests per day and we are in future proposed to increase up to 3000 tests per day. And basically we are using the RT2 PCR technique uh, for the detection of COVID-19 in CSIRNIST. So I will be talking about the different testing uh, techniques on COVID-19. Uh, so in case of the molecular assay for detection of viral nucleus, nucleic acid, so there are uh, different techniques. So a few of them are like one step RT-PCR, then RT lamp is there, there's slope mediated isothermal amplification, and CRISPR is there. Clustered regularly intercepts short palindromic repeats. And in case of the immunological assay, there are uh, ELISA and lateral flow immunoassay. I will be uh, uh, one by one, I'm going to give a brief regarding all the techniques. So, here what we are doing at RT PCR, as we all know that we are very much familiar with the RT PCR, so I will be directly going to the one step PCR, what we are doing in CSI and NIS. So in case of the one step PCR, we have a mixture. So in this mixture, we have all the ingredients required for the amplification. That is the reverse transcript test, the specific primer for COVID, probe, which has a fluorophorin five days end and a quincher in the three days end, and then tag polymers, NDPs, buffer, and whatever required for the RT PCR. So what exactly happened is the primer bind with the viral cDNA and uh, the tag polymer binds, then it makes the copy of those particular viral DNA. And once the copies are made, the probe attach with him. And after attachment, the uh, the tag polymer is the uh, quincher uh, from the reporter and which give the fluorescence. So basically, so when uh, there are lots of free, uh, free fluorophore, the fluorescence will increase, which will be detected by the thermocycler. And it is, uh, uh, which will give us a uh, result of the positive sample. So when in case of there is no viral cDNA, the probe cannot bind with the sequence and the fluorophore will remain sequenced. So it will not give you the fluorescence. So the result will be very little fluorescence or in fact, no. So in case of no fluorescence or very little, the result will be negative. So right now uh, there are three genes currently being tested worldwide for the RT-PCR. So these are the uh, RNA dependent RNA polymerase, then envelope protein and nucleoprotein. So this protein, also have similarities with the other uh, viruses, but uh, their research it has been stated in such a way that they have very little similarities. And in case of the RDRP, that is the RNA dependent RNA polymers, which is counted as the uh, confirmatory case. The when uh, in 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 Northeast Institute of Science and Technology, we go with the uh, 
uh, is in first and when we get the result of positive then we for the confirmatory test we go for the rdrp so why we select rdrp for the confirmatory is like uh, so Uh, the envelope protein and the nuclear protein are kind of the structural protein of the virus. However, RDPD, uh, RD, RP is from the genome. So basically, if the virus get mutated and if we only check the RDPD, then we may get false uh, negative results. So, however, if we check both the structural protein, that means we you are sure that the uh, uh, the RNA is from the viral uh, COVID. I mean, uh, RNA is from the COVID. to make sure that it is from the same covid family and then with the rdrp we are making it sure that we are getting a covid 19 positive apart from the other two viruses now going to the rt lamp so rt lamp is a uh, kind of new technique which is uh, started 10 years back and it has lots of uh, advantages over the rt pcr so the main thing about rt lamp that is uh, loop mediated isotypal thermal uh, amplification so from the name itself uh, you can see that we then need a thermocycler for it for this so that means when you get the kit for the lamp you can do it uh, without any sophisticated instrument so what happened in rt lamp so at the uh, three days end of the viral rna the transcript a uh, reverse transcriptase and the bip primer that is uh, backward inner primers uh, are bind which convert the rna to cdna once it is converted then at the three days end again dna polymerase and b3 primer will continue to generate the second seed uh, second complementary dna strain and the dna strain is designed in silico in such a way that it has the ability to displace the strain and release the first cdna strain so and and uh, after then the f1 uh, fib primers that is the forward inner primers will bind to the uh, release cdna strand which is released by the dna polymers and generate the complementary strain this is how it will generate the uh, dna strands one by one and uh, at the end you will get loss of dna and uh, when you have like you can how you can detect it so there are lots of uh, different techniques to detect it so you can detect it via photometry or you can detect it via measuring the turbidity that is uh, during this process the end product is phosphate precipitation so you can also uh, measure it by phosphate precipitation and the more most interesting thing is that we can give uh, indicators like uh, for example say uh, intercalary dye for the dna so which only binds mostly to the double stranded dna for example say cyber green which is bind mostly to the uh, uh, gc rich region and it you can detect with your naked eyes so the basic principle is like you mix all the reagent with the sample and you heat it at 65 degrees for 15 to 30 minute and after then you will get the result and you don't need any sophisticated instrument to detect it from your naked eye you can visualize the color change so i can already i am also showing you a flow chart where you can detect it in a very simple and normal way see here is the uh, sample you can take the saliva or or whether the swab then you just heat it then you add the uh, mixtures after adding the mixture you heat it for 30 minutes in uh, 65 degrees centigrade and here you can see the result so positive result indicates the yellow color whereas if it is pink then the result is negative so in case of india are we using that so this is the scenario of india so our minister doctor uh hers uh, hersvardhan sir he is already uh, uh, he already said that in may 27 that he will introduce the rt lamp for covid diagnostic test in india and triple i am jammu is taking care of it uh, to test the coronavirus detection with the help of uh, rt lamp next i'm going to crispr uh, so uh, basically crispr is like cluster regularly in interspace sort palindromic sequence so what happened crispr so crispr is basically a bacterial natural defense against the virus so here what happened uh, the palindromic dna from the palindromic dna uh, the rna synthesis that is the crispr rna or the or the tres rna then that the tres and crispr rna bind to the dna of the uh, virus and then again the tres 9 detect recognize the tres rna and cleave it so in case of covid 19 we have a viral rna so there are three methods the first the serlog assay what they do is like from the viral rna with the help of uh, recombinant polymerase amplification they make the dna and from that dna they use the cris uh, uh, cas19 to detect the complementary viral rna so once the complementary viral rna is detected the cas13 will cleave it and while cleaving it there are fluorophore attached with it which will give 
color. So basically, uh, uh, the uh, uh, Cas13 or the Cas12 will bind with the viral RNA, and once it is bind and cleave, then it will give a flu uh, fluorophore from which we can detect uh, the COVID. So in India also, the first uh, paper-based CRISPR technology was developed uh, by IGIB. So you can see they have used Cas9 uh, for the cleavage of the uh, DNA. So next, here come the ELISA. So in case of ELISA, there are two techniques where uh, we can use either direct ELISA for detecting the uh, COVID-19 or we can go with the sandwich. So basic difference with direct and sandwich ELISA. So in case of the direct ELISA, uh, what we do is that the plate is typically coated with the viral protein. So uh, once we take the sample, there is blood from the uh, patients. If uh, if the patient blood have the antibodies, then it will bind with the uh, antigen coated in the plate. So once it is binded, then again we give a secondary antibody level with the enzyme, which will again bind with it and give color fluorescence. So we can uh, read it in uh, spectroscopy. So it's the same antigen and antibody binding. So in case of the sandwich ELISA, the uh, plate is bind with the uh, in, in case C. Uh, the basic difference is in case of the direct ELISA, we are bind with the uh, we bind the anti uh, sorry uh, we bind the antibody to the plate. And in case of the sandwich ELISA, we first the antigen is bind with the plate. Then from from the patient we get the blood and we release it. If the viral antigen is present in the blood, then it will bind with the uh, antibody. Then again we give a secondary antigen having the enzyme level antibodies so which will give the color so ELISA is also another way to uh, detect the uh, sorry to detect the COVID however so I think the uh, RT lamp is much better technique to detect in uh, in place of the ELISA also then next is the uh, it is also an antibody antigen based technique so lateral flow immunoassay so here what happened the sample is moved via capillary flow on the uh, natrocellulose membrane when the COVID-19 antibodies are present, they will bind to the level antigen and continue to move until they are captured by the immobilized anti-human antibodies. The presence of the captured antibody antigen complex is visualized as a color taste band. So basically in the uh, natrocellular membrane, the antibodies are present and once you flow the uh, COVID-19 uh, sample from the COVID-19 patient, if uh, there are antigen present, then it will bind with the antibody and uh, there is a fluorophore. Uh, once the antigen antibody complex is formed, it will visualize as a color. So these are the different techniques. And uh, thank you so much. Later on, my fellow speaker will be go details in depth with the different techniques utilized and the uh, different type of drugs and other approaches in COVID-19. So I'm open for the question. So first question is like, are these primers are designed by our lab or broad? No, we haven't designed uh, the primers. These are brought from ICMR. Am I audible? Yes. yes. Okay. So first question I got from Anurana. So are these primers designed in CSI and NIST? No, we have brought these primers from ICMR. And the second question is which genes we are detecting. detecting. So in case of uh, amplifying, so in case of PCR, so basically there are three genes available. So out of this, we are mainly going with the uh, RNA dependent RNA polymerase and N block chain. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, so uh, our uh, next speaker is uh, Ms. Barbie Gogui. So uh, Ms. Gogui uh, is a senior research fellow working in the uh, medicinal and aromatic plant division. Uh, 
and uh, so Ms. Gogoi, uh, she will be talking about the immunoassay for uh, COVID-19. Okay, so uh, I am requesting Ms. Gogoi uh, to uh, take up this session, please. Speak loudly. Sir, it's audible. That quality network is coming. Speak loudly to make you audible. Yeah, I Good morning, yeah, yeah, all and all. Uh, okay, thank you, sir. Good morning to one and all. Myself, Barbie Gogo, I'm here to present a short discussion about immunoassay for COVID-19. So first, I would like to give a generalized introduction of COVID virus taken through the same electron, same electron microscope. This is the statistical data that are pro uh, produced in a few uh, last 10 days where India is from the la India is uh, from the last fourth positions in according to the world calculated statistical data. First, I would like to give us the importance of this rapid test. It, it, these tests are only introduced to overcome the uh, time taken by the RT-PCR. So uh, the importance of the test is this more the testing clear the picture means we could easily detect who, who is uh, infected or how much people need to be quarantined or isolated from the uh, community of people. It, therefore, it has to break the chain of transmission. In India, among 100 per, per people, only 0.08% of people are tested in India, which is called less in compared to US and Italy. Moreover, who also recommended near tenfold increase in testing to keep the positive rate low. Therefore, we need to speed up our testing facilities in India as well as around the world. Otherwise, inadequate testing may lead to a great challenge to the mankind. First, I would like to discuss about antibody test. It is also known as serology test. It is basically focused on two immunoglobulin, IgM and IgG. IgM is the first antibody produced. IgM is the first antibody uh, and immunoglobulin produced after the infection and IgG is the is produced on after the development of IgM. IgA is also an immunoglobulin that is produced of during the infection, but research are still going on this type of immunoglobulin. The in antibody are the protein produced by the immune system. After the infection, it gives immune response to the infection. It mainly, the kit of antibody test mainly detect IgM and IgG. Advantages of this test are easy to use, cost effective, and ensure immunity development. Limitation is that it gives false negative or false positive results depend on the viral load. And diagnosis of acute and recent infection cannot be diagnosed as the antibodies are produced 7 to 14 days after the symptoms. This is the generalized illustration of growth phase for both antigen and IgM and IgG antibody, where 0 to 5 days are considered to be an asymptomatic stage in an infected person. And after the 7 days, IgM antibody is developed in the body to fight against the infection. And after the development of in IgM, IgG antibody is developed, which may last for a month or year. If the IgM antibody increases, it means that the anti patients with uh, infected antigens might decrease. And, and uh, finally, after 28 days, the patients may be regarded as immune to the antivirus. Based on this principle, the uh, antibody test kits were made where the uh, blood from the patients, either in capillary or in vial via micropipette, is placed onto a sample well in a de detection kit. 
where the samples from the antibody migrates towards the uh, tested re result window where if the antibody is present it may form it may interact with the antibody present in the kit and forms a color band presence on based on presence or absence of bands positive negative and invalid results are detected if all the bands are present in the control and tested m or g in result window it is considered to be positive if the bands are absent in the tested window that is for g and m it is considered to be negative and if the bands are absent in control then the band, that test is considered to be a invalid test these are the basic detection kit recently recognized by food and drug administrations the first is the standard q covid 19 igm and igg combo that is used to detect the quantity of antibodies similarly aclex antibody kit it is also de detect the quantity of antibody specificity is recommended to be 99.8% and 100% sensitivity then bost pre analytic vivalytic device is a first automated molecular diagnostic tool that uses biological cartis to detect the uh, presence of virus in the infected blood then sonar nanotech it is the sonar nanotech test it is from the canada where it, it uses gold based uh, particle to interact with the antibody and then it migrates towards the result window by producing positive or negative band and human igg elisa kit it is a it is a kit made in india based on the principle of elisa to detect the presence of antibody apart from antibody test recent uh, recent who introduced the antigen test where it mainly focus on spike global protein and nucleocapsid protein spike is responsible for virus entry in a infected person and nucleocapsid is a immuno dominant protein that may interact with rna this uh, test is used to detect sars cov2 antigen in the body it is a point of care and a sample taken is a swab sample from the patient it uses in containment zone and healthcare systems due to scarcity of the test icmr only recommend icmr and aims and who also recommend the use of this test only in the containment zone and healthcare system the it, it uh, produce confirmatory results in days of positive and negative results where positive results are considered to be true positive and negative results should be tested again by rt pcr to do out of infections hence this test should uh, were considered to be a non confirmatory test as the negative results need to be validified again with rt pcr and advantages are easy to use identify acute or early infections as as during the acute or early infections antibody replicates antigens replicates must faster in the early phase it is a cost effective techniques based in compared to rt pcr based technique and it can consume less time less than 30 minutes and limitations is higher chance of getting false negative therefore it is regarded as a non confirmatory test principle of antigen test is that we take a, a swab sample from a infected person this swab sample is then mixed with extraction buffer where it dissolve the mucus layer and the virus containing the liquid is then put into the analyte well where it interacts with the recorded antibodies that is already present in the kit then it migrates towards the uh, test line via capillary action present in the nitrocellulose membrane and when it bind with the test line it antigen is present it will bind with the test line forming a sandwich between antibody antigen and uh, dye detected antibody re which results in producing a colored bands its result interpretation is similar to that of the antibody interpretation where colored band is control line and test line are considered to be positive a uh, colored band only in the control line is considered to be negative and if the co co control line doesn't have any color then the test is considered to be invalid the different types of test kit recently introduced uh, where in the world where sofia 2 sir antigen fia it is introduced only in the us and on 9th may 2020 then this is the tokyo based fujirio in 
intizen kit this is the only kit that is being used in japan it is not exported outside of the japan till now then standard q covid az detection kit it is a it is produced by sd korean company sd biosensor on 19 june 2020 it cost around 450 and it is recently practiced in delhi maharashtra and uttar pradesh after the uh, permission given by icmr and aims and future prospects for this uh, development kit is that that we should develop a home based kit like uh, at a cheaper rate like that of the pregnancy kit available in the market it should be accurate affordable and easy to manufacture the test should not should be integrated with a mobile app so that we could easily detect the results and we and could gen and the results could be generated to the health department these are the few important medicinal plants that could have a possible effect on covid-19 uh, or or you can say it these plants could help to boost our immune systems Okay. There is a one question uh, raised by Janis Thapar. How antibody are developed for ELISA? So B cell produced B cell uh, produced the antibody by hybridoma technology. The, it is it is results in a monoclonal antibody formations. is this genetic asked by the uh, shivam kashyap so this test are recently introduced the no, it is a non confirmatory test so more research is going on on this test kit so ravi jaiswal asked one question can this kit detect the stage of covid no it is still not clear whether um, the person can uh, can be detected with um, um, with which face they are, they are affect uh, they are affected with the antigen so thank you okay uh, thank you uh, Miss uh, Gogoi, uh, for your uh, nice presentation. So next, uh, next, next, next speaker will be uh, Mr. Rohi Shahu. And uh, so, uh, Mr. Uh, Shahu will be speaking about the uh, different uh, AI-based approaches uh, that are artificial intelligence-based approaches. Uh, for the uh, detection of uh, covid-19 so mr sahu is a junior research fellow uh, working in the biotechnology division of csr nist so so i would like to welcome uh, mr sahu for his uh, lecture Okay, so please, Mr. Shahu, say this session is for you. Thank you, sir, and hello, everyone. Myself, Ravi Kumar Shahu, and I'll be speaking on COVID-19 and AI-based approaches. Okay, am I audible? Yes. Go ahead. Your yes. slides also are yeah. visible, eh? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. 
Yes. So artificial intelligence or AI is a simulation of human intelligence processes by machines, especially computer systems. Specific applications of AI include expert systems, natural language processing, speech recognition, and machine vision. So in today's world, be it self-driving cars, just playing computers, or Alexa, all these modern marvels are possible because of machine learning and artificial intelligence. So this slide shows a graphical representation of the whole artificial intelligence scenario and COVID-19. So be it impact on travel, financial markets, impact on trade, finding a vaccine, infection and spread, workforce impact, recovery response, or media's role, everyone, everything can be tracked using artificial intelligence and the machines can learn this process gradually and be of help to humans. So this uh, track shows all the fields where artificial intelligence can be of use to humans. So next, Next slide is visible. I think we have some network issues here. Is the slide visible? Yes. yes. Open ahead. data port. Yeah. So we are facing yeah. some network issues. Yeah. 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 Thank you, sir. We are facing some network issues, so we are sorry for that. So this slide shows the open data projects and distributed computing to find AI driven approaches which can tackle the COVID 19 pandemic. So we have four approaches as detection, prevention, response, and recovery. So in detection, first we early warning signals that is we can detect and digital smoke signals that is we can hide them but not the smoke so an ai based tool called blue dot blue dot was the first ai based tool which detected the covid-19 first uh, symptoms and predicted that it could be a pandemic second we have the diagnosis that is pattern recognition using medical imagery and symptom data example ct scans x rays x rays etc next prevention we can predict that is calculating a person's probability of infection. An example is Epirix, which is an AI based tool which can predict a person's probability of infection based on his symptoms, age, the area he lives in, etc. Surveillance to monitor and track contagion in real time, that is contact tracing. It basically, a database management system, when equipped with AI tools, we can. Uh, use that as a surveillance tool also. So information, personalized news and content moderation to fight misinformation. That is in social networks, we can fight misinformation as to which data is right, correct, or which data is misinforming or misleading. Then the response, we have delivery. Drones for material transport, robots for high exposure tasks at hospitals. Example is cruiser robot. And now Amazon India has also started a drone, its drone delivery for medicines. Next, service automation, deploying, triaging, virtual assistants and chatbots. Example, Canada's COVID-19 chatbot. So these chatbots can reply to your queries in real time. And those queries are also saved in the systems and servers for future screening or for future predictions. Next, recovery. That is the monitor, track economic recovery through satellite, GPS, and social media data. WeBank is using such an AI tool to track all the economic related activities. So next we have an AI based approach and a conventional approach or a non AI based approach. We have a comparison. So in an AI based approach, a physician first identifies the possible match of COVID-19 symptom with AI support. That is with an app, with an uh, online uh, tool such an X, such an X-ray 
uh, like uh, detection tool. So samples taken to confirm infection and decide further therapy. Then the patients get quarantined or admitted. Then start AI based treatment and monitoring. That is the AI based monitoring is done in all the steps. Then the patient goes to a recovery phase. Then retest for COVID. If it has positive, he goes for isolation. If it has negative, he is cured. Similarly, in a conventional approach, the difference is that physician analyze the symptoms physically. If he finds multiple matches in the symptoms, then the test sample is taken. If no matches are found, then no test sample is taken. Patients get quarantined or admitted, symptom, uh, symptomatic treatment started, recovery phase, retest for COVID-19. If positive, then isolation, negative, then cured. So as we can see, and the AI based approach, the AI based tools are continuously monitoring the patient and in every step we come to know or we can treat the patient in a better way. Then researchers at IIT Gandhinagar developed an AI based tool to detect COVID-19 with chest x-rays. So this online tool developed indicates the probability of a person is infected with COVID-19. It can essentially be used as a quick preliminary diagnosis before the medical test and is currently being tested by the Indian Institute of Physical Public Health. Sorry, The researchers who have developed the test believe that with the limited testing facility for COVID-19, many countries are rushing towards developing AI tools for quick analysis using x-rays. Developing a reliable tool requires a combination of right algorithm and data. So this is where this tool would prove useful since it can be trained for diagnostic purpose and can be made available for wider use in future. So this test was developed by pooling the data of X-ray images of COVID-19 infected patients, along with that of healthy people from various sources available on the internet. With these images, they train a machine learning architecture using deep learning algorithms and model. And this model had a 12 layer of neural network. So they further explain that the deep learning method learns the disease diagnosis features from X-ray images in an automatic way. The tool can also be trained to use images from other lung infection, such as tuberculosis and pneumonia to ensure the specificity of detection of COVID-19 from other lung diseases. So the fact is that this simple machine learning architecture makes it stand out from the similar initiatives. There are thousands of other similar initiatives, but this makes it, uh, this stands out because it has a similar, it has a comparatively, <coughs> It has a comparatively blinking. Uh, it has a comparatively uh, similar approach, and however, the test is only indicative, and further clinical consultation is, is essential to confirm the diagnosis. They strongly believe that it will help reduce the burden on medical infrastructure with the current increase in the number of cases in the country. Many companies are now working on fighting COVID by developing tools and test centers. So ICMR, the ICMR web portal or the dashboards, which even our institute use, uses it to upload all the data so that the world knows. So the ICMR is also using an AI-based tool known as the IBM Watson Assistant. And it is uh, strengthening the India's COVID-19 testing facility. So this Watson Assistant is basically a chatbot and it also shares all the information with all the uh, dashboards all over the country. That is what you see in Google or anywhere. These, dash these dashboards communicate with each other in real time. Next, this new AI tool can predict COVID-19 without testing. So the artificial intelligence model described in the journal Nature Medicine uses data from the COVID symptom study app. It is an app based tool to predict SARS-CoV-2 infection by comparing people's symptoms and the results of the diagnostic test. So the researchers attempt to understand which symptoms linked to COVID-19 were most likely to be associated with a positive test. And based on the findings, the researchers suggested that a loss of sense of smell is a stronger predictor of COVID-19 than fever. So using a new mathematical model which they created, the scientists then predicted with nearly 80% accuracy whether an individual is likely to have COVID based on the age, sex combination, and a combination of four key symptoms. So these key symptoms were smell, or persistence of cough, fatigue, etc. So next, artificial intelligence tools aims to tame the coronavirus literature. The COVID-19 literature has grown in much the same way as the disease transmission exponentially. The NIH COVID-19 portfolio 
a website that tracks papers related to SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus and the disease it caused lists more than 28,000 articles. So far, too far or too many for a researcher to read manually. But a fast growing set of artificial intelligence tool might help researchers and clinical, uh, clinicians to quickly search through the literature. So driven by the combination of factors, including the availability of large collection of relevant papers, advances in natural language processing technology and urgency of the pandemic itself, these tools use AI to find the studies that are most relevant to the user, and in some cases to extract specific findings, that is what the user wants. From the results, beyond the current pandemic, such tools could help to bridge fields by making it easier to identify solutions from other disciplines. This literature search tool is named as COVID Scholar, developed by the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory in Berkeley, California. So various other tools like the COVID sound app wherein the voice, short recordings of cough and breathing of a COVID infected patient can be recognized are under process and the machines are still learning at the Uli University of California. All coronavirus dashboards from the testing labs are in touch via AI interacting in real time, updating you about the present scenario of the pandemic. One such dashboard is a John Hopkins Coronavirus Resource Center. This dashboard is completely run by AI now. That is all the, the data uploaded, uploaded every day in real time is done by AI. There's no manual interference. So now AI is showing its potential in communication, detection, response monitoring, etc. in this pandemic, without which we cannot think of a scenario we would be going through. So we have some questions. Divyanshu Yadav, he asks, why we are not able to prepare any medicine when we know all features of COVID-19? So firstly, we have some vac vaccines which are in human trial. That is the Covaxin vaccine developed by Bharat Biotech India. Oxford is also working on Cadox vaccine for COVID-19. So the uh, work on vaccines are going on, but we have not come to a conclusion about that. Next, Parveen. Parveen has asked, ginger has antiviral components against COVID. Is it? Yes, it is under research and we cannot say as of now, is it is it actually uh, has the antiviral components or it doesn't have? Next, Anamika Arpan, is there any AI-based approach in India? Niti Ayo, IIT Rookie AI software uses X-ray to detect COVID. Yes, AI-based approaches are presently prevalent in India. One such app is the Arogya Setu, which the government is recommending. So that app, what it does, it tracks all the patients near you using your Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. That is, all the patients, if they've installed that app, they can, uh, they can see um, the patients or the person which have travel history or those who have tested negative or positive. This app gives you all the information in real time about the persons who are near you. If you have, if you are outside, it's outside your home or somewhere that is in a public place. I think we don't have any questions. So we'll go to the next speaker. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Shahu, uh, for uh, enlightening us uh, about, about the role of uh, uh, different machine learning tools uh, for the detection of the uh, COVID-19. So uh, our next speaker is uh, Mr. Anjum uh, Dhingya. So, so Mr. Dhingya uh, will be talking uh, about the convalescent uh, plasma therapy. Uh, for the uh, treatment of the COVID-19. So, Mr. Dingya so, uh, is an SRF uh, work, working in the Biological Science and Technology Division. And uh, so, uh, I would like to welcome Mr. Dingya uh, for his uh, speech. <coughs> Okay, Mr. Dinya, please. Uh, 
good morning to one and all uh, today in this series of covid lecture i am going to present my presentation on a very special topic known as the covalent plasma therapy the why's and hows so at the very outset i want to uh, show you some news that has been in the headlines since the first few months so the first news says that a welcome change on icmr's clearance on using convalescent plasma therapy so in this news they are saying that icmr has given clearance for the use of plasma therapy even there is another news known uh, uh, which is shown as john hopkins gets fda okay to test blood therapies for covid-19 patients so even john hopkins has given the okay to uh, test plasma therapy similar there are other news like india has also permitted convalescent plasma trial for covid-19 maharashtra to start world's largest plasma trial so why this plasma trial is in the trend so what is actually this convalescent plasma therapy so i am going to give you a brief overview about the process and the molecular insights about this convalescent plasma therapy next so uh, this lady she is an indian model and her name is jova moradi so this lady she was infected with coronavirus and she has recovered from the disease and this lady she has donated her blood plasma to help the patients who are currently battling the virus so this was reported by mumbai mirror that this lady who has been cured from the covid 19 attack her plasma was used to treat a patient suffering from covid-19 so what actually this blood plasma therapy is so so this therapy it is not a new technique it is a 100 years old technique and was first developed by an by this gentleman known as amil adolf von pering so this gentleman he discovered this plasma therapy and it is worth mentioning that he was awarded the first nobel prize in physiology or medicine for this discovery and the term convalescent refers refers to a recovering from illness or medical treatment convalescent plasma therapy was done in 1892 for treating diphtheria also it was used during the spanish influenza pandemic of 1918 uh it is also been mentioned that in variety of viral infections that includes measles mars h1n1 h5n1 avian flu ebola and severe acute respiratory infections sr1 viruses so now let me give you a brief overview about this convalescent plasma therapy and how it actually works so what is the funda behind this therapy so here you can see a flow diagram and you can see this this is a patient who was initially infected with this deadly suppose in case sars cov2 virus so this patient he has recovered from this illness so now so now the question is how this patient has recovered obviously he has given he has been given the normal medi medications the normal drugs but since there are no specific drugs or vaccines for this sars cov2 virus we can say that this patient is immunologically strong and he has developed some 
immunity against this virus. So, I would like to mention that whenever a virus or a foreign, foreign particle enters into your body, your body has a natural tendency to fight against these foreign particles. As a result, there is a system in your body known as the immune system. It helps the uh, uh, organism to fight against the foreign particles. So what this immune system do is that it develops some small protein molecules, also known as magic bullets and popularly known as the antibodies. So suppose a virus enters this person's body, his immune system will try to develop some antibodies against that virus. Okay, and those antibodies will try to kill those viruses. And in this plasma therapy, what we do is that since this person has recovered from the virus by producing those magic bullets or antibodies, these antibodies will be taken from this cured person in the form of blood plasma. So we'll be collecting the blood plasma from this patient. We'll be collecting it. As you can see here, the blood is drawn. And in the drawn blood, there are the specific antibodies against SARS-CoV-2 virus. And these antibodies will be injected to a infected patient who has been recently been infected by SARS-CoV-2. So the thing is, in plasma therapy, ready-made antibodies that is prepared in a recovered patient is transfused into the infected patient. So this is the overall process how the plasma therapy works. So now I would like to give you a brief overview about how this antibody is produced. As I have told you that antibodies are produced by this recovered person. So the, the question is how these antibodies are produced. So see, mainly there are two types of antibodies that fights against this virus that is known as the IgM and IgG. So suppose in this diagram you can see that this is a virus. Suppose this is a SARS-CoV-2 virus and it has, it has entered the cell. So as soon as the virus enters the cell, virus sets off its prote uh, protein coating. As you can see, the protein coating has been shed and it, and, and it is released into the cytoplasm. And here it uses the host machinery. So this virus is not active, but uh, it doesn't have its own enzymes. But this, en this virus uses the enzymes of the host and begins to replicate. So when, the, when it begins to replicate inside the cell, some of the, this virus, they enters the proteasome. As you can see, these viral proteins, they enters the proteasome. So proteasome is a part of the cell where there are some enzymes called proteins, low molecular weight proteins, which chop these vi vi viral fragments. And these viral fragments are loaded into a small protein molecule, which is Situated in, situated in the endoplasmic reticulum, and this is known as the MHC complexes. So MHC, major histocompatibility complex. So here, the proteins, these are loaded into this major histocompatibility complex, and the role of this MHC is to transport these viral fragments to the outer, outer outside of the cell. So this MHC will project these uh, viral fragments to the outside. So why it is necessary? Why it is necessary to project these viral fragments to the outside so that the cell can alert the immune system. Like, yes, I have been infected, you come to my rescue. So once this comes and see, you can see here, it goes it goes out of the cell and it goes to the Golgi where it is, from where it is transported to the outside of the cell. See, this viral fragments, blue color, it is projected outside. Now the cell is give, giving an alert to all the immune cells. Just you please come and help me because I'm being infected. Okay, so see, so T cell comes to it. So T cell, so there are two types of immune cells mainly. So T cell and B cell. So this, so this T cell comes and it binds with the MHC complex. And now this T cell gets activated. Okay. See, after this interaction, this, this is a T cell. It gets activated and it produces some cytokines that will kill this infected cell. So this is how the infected cell has been killed. Okay, so now, in addition to this, here you can see, so this is, this is the same thing. Okay, so see this, this T-cell is, this cell is activated. And after this T-cell is activated, in one way, it will kill the virus by secreting cytokines. And the other way, kill is that this T-cell will again activate some 
other specialized cell known as the B cell or the B lymphocyte. Okay. So as we all know that the B cell, B, B cell is solely responsible for the production of antibodies. So as I have already told you that in plasma therapy, we use the antibodies from the recovered patient. And those recovered patient has already produced the antibodies against the specific SARS-CoV-2 virus. So this B cell will be producing the antibodies. This B cell gets activated. It activates the B cell and this B cell will uh, create the required an antibodies like the IgM and IgG. And after specific, this, uh, specific antibodies are produced, these antibodies are transfused from the cured patient to the infected patients. And that is how the entire process works. So, the advantages of this convalescent plasma therapy. So, how it is useful to us and why the entire world is very much concerned about this theory, why they are very interested in this plasma therapy. Since we do not have any specific drugs or vaccines, scientists all around the world are trying to dig in this theory because they are hopeful about this theory. So, this therapy is normally used for very sick patient who do not respond to other treatments or drugs. Okay, so it's kind of an emergency therapy. Convalescent therapy may be also useful for people with COVID-19 who are not helped by other treatments. Okay, so, and although this therapy is in news, although it is therapy it is very popular, in, even in India, in US, this therapy is widely used and all the uh, health agencies has uh, given clearance to perform this therapy only as clinical trials. They have not, given the clearance for its treatment for against COVID-19. They have only give, given permission for clinical trials. So it is not clinically proven whether this plasma therapy will be an effective treatment for SARS-CoV-2. However, this treatment might improve our ability to recover from the disease. So these are a few advantages of the therapy. So the success rate. So how, how much this therapy is successful against the SARS-CoV-2 infection? So in a recent study published in the proceedings of the National Academy of Science, Clinical, clinicians have reported that convalescent plasma therapy improved the outcomes of 10 patients with severe cases of COVID-19. Also, another st study published in the journal, journal of the Camer American Medical Association reported that five patients who were receiving mechanical ventilation and were then administered convalescent therapy had recovered from the disease. So these are, although the outcome is not that acceptable, although it is not 100% the success rate is not 100%. Still, the uh, clinical trials are going on about this theory. So, the ma major disadvantages of this theory, well, what are the disadvantages of this convalescent plasma therapy? So, the main disadvantage is that this therapy might produce some allergic reactions. Allerg allergic reactions in the sense, suppose uh, a plasma from the donor is transfused to the recipient. So, the donor plasma have, may have some small protein molecules or some other allergens that may be not allergic to the donor, but it may be allergic to the recipients. So in that way, the recipient blood may take the molecule as foreign and, and it may produce some allergic reactions. Moreover, such therapy may give you chills at the time of blood transfusion. So whenever the blood is transfused from the donor to the recipients, you may have chills, fever, okay, lung damage and difficulty in breathing. So, these are the few disadvantages. Moreover, there is a chance of transmission of infections, including HIV and hepatitis B and C. So, before transfusion, many parameters have to be checked before transfusing the blood plasma from the donor to the recipient blood. And the most important disadvantage of this is we do not know the exact dose of convalescent plasma that is to be uh, donated to the recipient for the effective viral load clearance. Okay, so we do not know the exact dose. So the clinical trials are going on. Okay, so we do not know the exact dose. How, how much plasma is to be transfused to the blood of the recipient? So the takeaway message from this therapy is that this therapy is coming out as one of the most important methods in the treatments of severe COVID-19 patients in the absence of definite treatments or drugs for the same. So it, I, want to, I want to mention here that Recently, the Maharashtra government has project uh, has uh, initiated a project known as Project Katina, which will be the world's largest covalescent plasma therapy trial come treatment for a treatment of COVID-19 patients. Moreover, all the major leading health organization of the world, like the US, in US, 
the Food and Drug Administration ACMR. This organization have approved the use of plasma therapy from recovered COVID-19 COVID patients only for trial purposes. They have only allowed the trial purpose for, for allowed the use of this plasma for only for trial purposes. Although there are numerous outcomes of plasma therapy, ICMR has clearly stated that there are no approved therapies for COVID-19, including plasma therapy. Okay. So the world is still being experimented and more random clinical trials are necessary to rely on its on its effectiveness against the deadly SARS-CoV-2 virus. So what are the future prospects of this plasma theory? So the major drawback is that we do not know the, or as I've already mentioned, we do not know the exact amount of plasma or how much antibody is to be transferred from the donor to the recipient. Okay, so this is the major drawback. Also, we know that antibody has a specific half-life. So we do not know what is the half-life of these newly produced antibodies against the SARS-CoV-2 virus? Okay, so I think to avoid the uncertainty and risk, because we all know that there is a risk while uh, transfusing the plasma from the donor to the recipient. So I think we can hypothesize that we can, instead of transfusing the direct plasma from the donor to the recipient, what if we can uh, synthesize these antibodies that are produced in the recovered patients artificially? So we already know the nature of the antibodies, right? That is pro produced in the recovered patients against SARS-CoV-2 virus. So what if we can synthesize this antibody because we, we already know the uh, variable region sequence of that antibody. So we can, I think that will be a very good approach if we, if we can uh, synthesize these specific antibodies uh, synthetically. Okay, and, that, and I think that will be a major breakthrough in plasma therapy research. So thank you for your time. So I have a few questions. So the first question is from Priyanka Arora. So she asks, does plasma therapy ensure that COVID-19 won't reoccur in infected patient? No, the answer is no, okay. So the, my, my next question is uh, from Nikhil Sakle. So he asks, what is the success rate of this therapy? So see, uh, this therapy is, being, is, is, is currently in clinical trial. So there's one or two studies which I have already shown that 10 plus uh, 10 patients from uh, 10 patients have required in China. Even in Delhi, recently uh, there is a news that in Delhi five patients has, have recovered. So there are not such scientific evidence how many what is the success rate, but it is under clinical trial. So the next question is from Komal Arora. What uh, the question is, question she asks is. What is the probability of getting reinfected once recovered after COVID-19 infection? Does antibodies produced against this infection remain active or activate upon reinfection? So see, these are this is this therapy. We do not have any concrete conclusion regarding this theory, so we cannot say the probability. Okay, so uh, we, we do not know till date, but researches are going on and. Hopefully, we'll be getting it to know a few days later. Which one? Okay. So, sir, does antibodies produce? So, the second part of the question is: Does antibodies produce against this infection remain active or activate upon reinfection? Okay. So, see, antibody may get depleted but there may be existence of memory B cell as a part of adaptive memory. So we all know that whenever the antibodies are produced, there is a production of plasma B cell and the memory B cell. So maybe uh, there, may, there may be some existence of memory B cell that act as a part of adaptive immunity. And if there is any infection, that memory B cell can produce that particular antibody against the virus. So there is another question from Dr. Prasad. Can we invent vaccine or drug by using antibodies can we invent vaccine or drug by using antibodies from plasma therapy? Uh, I think uh, no. So if we know the protein, then we can go for monoclonal antibody other than vaccine. We can, yes, obviously we can pro produce the monoclonal antibody other than vaccines. So thank you all.
so uh, thank you mr dinga uh, for this uh, ni nice presentation on the plasma therapy uh, for the treatment of the covid 19 patients so uh, our uh, next speaker is uh, mr pankaj barman uh, so uh, mr barman he is a grf working in the biotechnology division of cshn nist so mr barman uh, he will be uh, discussing about the uh, approaches and the progress of covid 19 drugs and uh, vaccines worldwide and so mr barman so he will be uh, enlightening us about the basics of the vaccines and also uh, like the how uh, people are using uh, uh, this approaches uh, for the uh, mitigation of the uh, covid-19 pandemic okay, so now i would like to invite uh, mr barman uh, for his uh, speech Mr. Borman, please. Sir. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Am I audible? Hello. Yes, audible. Yes. Yes. Go ahead. Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. Today I am going to first of all for uh, know the uh, drug and vaccine target. We have to know the what is vaccine, general principle of the vaccine, and uh, how this vaccine and drug are targeted for a particular disease. Then vaccine. You uh, maybe of all uh, are uh, aware about the vaccine that that vaccine is a passive immunization molecule a substance that used to stimulate the production of antibodies and prepared from the causative agent like microorganism like virus and bacteria and their uh, toxin product toxic product and like that and uh, this is mainly uh, the vaccine mainly boost our immune uh, immunity against this virus and toxins or of the particular toxins next different types of vaccines what are the different types of vaccines we have we have uh, uh, see like life attenuated vaccine these are tuberculosis uh, oral polio vaccines mosquitoes rotavirus vaccine yellow fever uh, in the life attenuated vaccine actually all whole the organism that is microorganism we used to um, uh, used as a vaccine which is in life condition and the second second type that is inactivated vaccine in this part we use the virus in killed or uh, we killed uh, in a killed uh, killed uh, condition okay and uh, these are uh, whole uh, cell pertussis inactivated polio virus vaccine also this in this category then subunit vaccine subunit vaccine means a particular molecule which is the toxic for this host uh, uh, host and uh, we using the we are using here uh, uh, this particular uh, sub unit or toxin for this uh, vaccine actually these are acellular uh, acellular pertussis hemophilus influenza and hepatitis b also and this, uh, and the uh, another uh, tox category is toxoid vaccine in this vaccine actually some bacteria are produce toxins which are uh, which are uh, infectious for our, uh, the host cell but toxoid vaccine in, uh, in toxoid vaccine we using this synthetic molecule which is produced by the bacteria and which is uh, actually uh, venomous or actually toxoid for this animal so we um, instead of using the virus or virus particle or anything about the virus we are using the synthetic particle synthetic toxoid particle okay an example of this toxoid category is diphtheria toxoid and tetanus toxoid here is the some uh, in array of vaccines that virus uh, we can use in inactivated and we can uh, we can 
a condition we can uh, also use uh, um, uh, viral vector in replicating on rep non replicating condition we can also use the virus or bacteria's nucleic acid in dna or rna also uh, uh, or the and protein based which are protein subunit or virus like particles we can use okay good next come to the next slide here are the components of some vaccines components of a vaccines are antigen antigen is the main part of a vaccine which is accelerated the accelerator which produce the antibody against it okay then the antigen is the most important part of a vaccine then stabilizer then for uh, antigen for and um, for stabilizing the antigen we need some stabilizer uh, for and that's why we are using the stabilizer on the vaccine okay then Uh, like that gelatin and polysorbate are the uh, stabilizers which are mainly used in the vaccine next adjuvant adjuvants are some molecules which are uh, increase the uh, increase the uh, increase the uh, role of the vaccine actually uh, adjuvant are adjuvants are uh, used for long lasting immunity actually adjuvants are uh, different molecules and uh, another from uh, antigen and we are uh, mixing the antigen and the adjuvant it will be uh, uh, it will be furnish a big response or big immunity uh, against the bacteria in host body okay then antibiotics antibiotics also used in vaccine because antibiotics are uh, uh, take a uh, form a barrier against any bacteria for um, um for dismissing the vaccine okay. next preservative preservative what is preservative preservatives are uh, lots of preservatives are there in the, for uh, manufacturing a vaccine preservatives are mainly preserve for the bacteria or virus particles uh, which are uh, infectious which are uh, hazardous for the vaccine okay next we are going next slide root of admission there are voice voice hello next some routes of administration we know uh, there are uh, lots of um, lots of route of administration of a vaccine like uh, intramuscular injections subcutaneous injection intradermal injection oral um, administration and intranasal spray um, spray applications also uh, uh, here um, uh, here uh, see some no in nasal spray application we have, uh, we are not actually used this uh, this route of administration because uh, recently uh, grafts okay, recently the gscvs a, a organization of us who, who is continue uh, continuously reviewing the safety of vaccine administration by the international route because it is not properly um, properly um, a Or, uh, properly a properly a proper uh, route for this administration of the virus okay go to the come to the next slide here vaccine testing and approval process what is the uh, next we discuss about vaccine testing and approval process in the vaccine testing and approval process first of all we have to uh, we have to uh, we have to target a molecules against whom we are going to make a vaccine okay so stages of vaccine development that's first step is laboratory and animal studies in this step there are three steps only that is exploratory stage preclinical stage and ind application in exploratory stage there is actually uh, first of all we have to know about the virus virus genetic materials virus molecules which are virus molecular pathway for infection and uh, like this so that is the exploratory phase okay that is in this exploratory phase we know about all about we have to know about all the um, all about this virus okay then come to preclinical stage then fix the target we have we have to go the first clinical on the clinical stage that is on the cell culture stage on the uh, mouse rat or monkey model stage also 
or rabid model stage that is called preclinical stage after the preclinical stage we have to ind application ind application is a trading application that's mean it is uh, when ever you got a pre got a yellow got a green preclinical state result then you have to apply for a ind application that means for uh, for conduct the uh, uh, next process with a, um, another public uh, companies with another uh, trade organization okay for broad uh, because you have to because you have to manufacture it if it will be successful and that's why you have to uh, con contact conduct with you have to contact with um, uh, any trade organization or of manufacturing agency okay so in the next step the this stage is clinical studies with human subject that is in this phase we are going to going to test in the human in the in human and uh, we are going to um, uh, the final testing procedures that is in phase 1 there is uh, lots of uh, go to the next slide actually mm, in phase 1 there is uh, is the vaccine safe or not it will be uh, it will be uh, determined and and uh, the bad side effects uh, are avoided or not we have to check also in this phase and uh, does the immune, immune system produce antibodies or not we have to check in this phase also and people are tested in this phase are 10 to 100 and uh, after the uh, after the first phase result if yes then go to the further uh, phase 2 and uh, if no then stop testing for this vaccine in phase 2 is the vaccine safe is the immune response strong or is the doses correct then it uh, then it will be go to the phase 3 otherwise it will go for stop the testing uh, in phase 2 there are also people uh, tested 100 more than 100 people and the phase 3 there are safety prevents infection and disease across lots of the people or not we have to check this type of study okay and in these people are in this stays we are uh, actually they are going to stays more than 10000 people and this testing may be not, not maybe it this thing must be on the uh, blind and random testing that's mean any uh, do not know anyone that whether one man will be trailed by the vaccine or not okay that is Uh, that is called dark and random testing and phase 3 is the dark and random testing process uh, stage okay next next steps approval and license that's is regulatory review and approval next the approval for uh, after the phase 3 result after got the uh, green result of the phase 3 we have to go the approval or license from uh, some organization that is uh, uh, conducted by the who also and uh, for this for this license uh, if we got the license from this uh, particular organization then we can uh, go from go to the um, go for the manufacturing and quality control okay the, and these approval agencies are there in india drug controller general of india dcgi is the def- department of central drug standard that means cdsco is the main um, in the main agency for uh, for for specify the category of drugs and uh, vaccines okay and in uh, another country the us there are fda which is uh, conducted all this process actually and uh, in uh, in european union european medicine agency supervise in, uh, in this in this field and uh, actually uh, these organizations are the world health organization uh, makes recommended and biological product are used internationally and many countries have adopted the who standard 
and that is called the National Regulatory Authority or NRA. Next, next, manufacturing after the phase uh, successful phase three trial, we are going to approval and li uh, license, and then the uh, manufacturing will be continued. And uh, next, quality control. Quality control is during the treatment or during the treatment by this vaccine, we are uh, we are going to take information from the uh, hospitals or um, uh, like that uh, where where we can get the where we can get the any report about the uh, symptoms uh, or like that adverse symptom and that is the call uh, and after this getting the sim symptoms or uh, after getting this information from hospitals or any uh, but, uh, but treatment uh, we are going to review this and then the uh, then they have to uh, they have to introduce the quality control also and this is called the VARS, v a e r s the vaccine adverse event reporting system next Mechanism of infection of SARS-CoV-2 virus. You all about uh, you all maybe know about the SARS-CoV-2 virus structure and uh, uh, and uh, so I am not going to uh, details about that and I am going to uh, uh, in the we are going uh, I am going in the literally uh, in a uh, surface of this part. Uh, SARS-CoV-2. SARS-CoV-2 have a uh, spike protein which is bind with the SC receptor. And uh, in the uh, spike protein there is hemagglutinin which is mainly uh, a high, uh, have a high affinity with SC2. And after the binding with SC2 there is another molecule TMPR SSR. I am not showing here. Uh, and um, this TMP SSR is a uh, fuse protein and uh, after the getting interaction with SE2 and the hemoglobin of the spike protein, the T, uh, TMP R, uh, SSR2 are going activated and uh, uh, ready for the fusion of this membrane protein. And after the entry of the virus by a, uh, by forming a endocytic vesicle, uh, here uh, the acid uh, here uh, virus uh, have come and. Uh, the RNA genome of this virus are uh, come in this uh, inside the cell. After the RNA genome, the uh, using by the host machinery, uh, there are two protein are uh, make. The, they are make two protein actually, PP1A and one um, AB. And this is the, the protein which is inactive, but uh, it is mandatory for a viral replication. But uh, until or unaware, uh, until this protein uh, become become break, it will not work, and that is that why that why I uh, that why it needs a, uh, needs a protease, and this protease is uh, come from this virus also because this virus is the uh, because this virus is um, uh, bearing this protein that is mpro. I'm not showing it here actually in the proteolysis part uh, uh, mainly involved in uh, this protein. And after the protein uh, uh, get uh, activated, the PP1 and uh, 1AB, this is acting as a replicase. Okay. And this uh, replicase is going the RNA genome, uh, which is going to Mm, uh, going to replicate the RNA genome of the RNA virus genome actually, and uh, after the virus genome uh, got replicated, it uh, it after uh, using host machinery, it going to um, make the mRNA. And after mRNA uh, get uh, after mRNA are getting the uh, the mRNA are going to produce um, produce protein by using the host machinery and assemble the budding and uh, the uh, Assemble the budding and the virus uh, form new virus form and new virus going to outside of the cell by um, uh, by exocytosis. So next, come to the drugs target site for COVID-19 virus. Drug is not nothing. Uh, uh, drug is a molecule. Nothing. 
nothing that um, uh, it is uh, involved in a uh, involved in the process of some uh, mechanism actually it is involved or interfere in the process actually for in for uh, viral uh, replication here first of all the when the endocytosis will occur this here is a no no sorry uh, first uh, in the spy protein when you get interacted with ac2 there is uh, another um, uh, molecule tmprss2 in which uh, um, uh, the nephum state and como state are targeted for this protein and uh, this uh, if this protein will be targeted by this track then it will be act uh, deactivated and the further process will not occur and uh, uh, chloroquine we know about that the ac who is block this ac2 and we also know about that hydroxychloroquine uh, used for malaria treatment and chloroquine this is actually inhibits the endosomal acidification of this covid virus okay next uh, we also know about the ramset disappear which is the uh, inhib which inhibit the replication and he is here is the lopinavir and ritinavir which is the inhibitor of m protease that's mean uh, this protein will not um, not going to activate it and uh, the further process will not uh, occur and uh, here um, this um, this slide is uh, about the drug target site of the covid-19 i think you um, all are um, able to understand next here is the analysis for therapeutic target by computational method that is molecular docking method here is uh, here uh, some researcher study about the gene drug databases on the covid-19 different molecule of covid-19 and they are going getting lots of uh, getting getting more interesting results that uh, they, the affinity will increase the affinity are high between this gene uh, drug and these molecules next some uh, drug and their status in this here are some companies and they are uh, they are they are going to produce actually they are uh, in the trial stage uh, these are the drug and here different vaccines under clinical trial now come to the vaccines part first of all we are uh, discussing about the mrna 12 20 one two seven three vaccine which is uh, which is manufacturing by the modern company collaboration with the nih and here the two research paper showing that this uh, this um, uh, this vaccine trial getting success up matlab phase one phase two and now it is on phase three next the more the principle of the modernness or approach of the modernness mrna vaccine approach here actually uh, they uh, in, inject the uh, they inject they inject the, the rna they inject the rna in the muscle and after uh, using host mechanism the viral protein chain uh, will uh, will Uh, will uh, manufacture by the virus mechanism system and the proteasome degraded and uh, the ms by using msc uh, it will getting uh, 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 immunity and uh, in second case the viral uh, viral rna also uh, entering on the apc means antigen presenting cell and the exogenous antigen that is viral antigen which is produced from the muscle cells uh, previously we injected this uh, if uh, this exogenous antigens also come on the apices and the uh, it uh, reflexes the antigenic uh, and uh, antigenic property and, and the vaccine will um, vaccine will getting the uh, antibody against that part and uh, the patient will recover from this and here is a series adox1 and cob and 19 that is another vaccine that is another vaccine uh, manufactured by andrew ferret and uh, professor sara gilbert from oxford university and here the simpanji adenovirus they use the simpanji and adenovirus which is uh, inactive which is not so many infectious for the human and the, in this rabies in this rabies virus uh, they incorporated the sars cov 
two virus uh, gene in this rabies virus and uh, and uh, get and uh, vaccine made the vaccine and incorporated in the patient and the patient become immunized and uh, that is the um, that is the uh, oxford university's uh, approach and here is covixin you know uh, all of you may be know about the covixin it is the uh, developed by the bharat biotech it is actually inactivated vaccine and inactivated that mean in this case the vaccine is killed uh, by any uh, killed by process and uh, it is uh, by bharat biotech in collaboration with icmr and nib next other vaccine under human clinical trial there is three covid 19 vaccine in human trial, uh, human trial uh, right now and uh, above this uh, three are we already discussed and another uh, 10 are here and the world organization uh, recognized it for 20 june there are 140 vaccines in various stages of development okay next thank you so so thank you Okay, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Borman, for your nice presentation. So actually, we are um, uh, running very first uh, to because we have another session also. So uh, right now we do not have uh, like enough time to take the questions. So I'll be go going going to the uh, for the last presentation uh, for today's uh, lecture. So the last uh, the speaker is uh, Mr. Colwell Roy. Uh, so mr roy will be talking about the uh, role of different micronutrients uh, to boost our immunity uh, to prevent this uh, covid-19 pandemic okay so uh, now i am inviting mr roy for his uh, presentation okay mr roy please take the session thank you sir hello everyone i'm myself kollul roy i'm a research fellow of csr north east institute of science and technology so here i am i am with you to talk about the uh, influential rate of dif different age groups on covid 19 infection and how we boost our immune system by taking the micronutrients so let's go here i am give you give you the introduction of all my lectures as you all know that covid 19 infection is spread worldwide and is known is uh, sars cov 2 and it's impact our body by binding through ac to receptor that is angiotensin converting enzyme to receptor as you know that ac e2 receptor uh, is meant uh, is helps our body to maintain the blood pressure but in sars cov 2 the virus hijack our ac2 machinery to uh, get impact in our cells and uh, impact our uh, immune cells so uh, as the age goes on the infection rate or the, the disease which are getting high like diabetes hypertension chronic pulmonary disease cardiovascular disease and still now there is research going on there is no effective and curative medi medicine is available and so what can we do so we take healthy foods to boost our immune system so that we can tackle uh, our body from uh, infect from our from the viruses and the food containing the macronutrients micronutrients which are very essential to boost our immune system in several ways so here in this chart you just see that the infection rate is proportional with the uh, age groups as the age uh, getting high the number of infection rate is high that in 80 plus or 
or 80, their infection rate 14.8 percent, uh, comparable to in uh, 20 to 29 and 10 to 19, the rate gradually decrease. So, it's uh, the there is depends on the uh, age and in. <coughs> so, why aged persons are more prone to COVID-19 infection? So, as I told earlier, that the number number of infection rate is gradually high if you get old, older because we are uh, prone to uh, different environmental stress and which causes different health issues like cardiovascular disease, diabetes, chronic respiratory disease, hypertension, and along with our bod body. Uh, 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 this thymic and what is thymic atrophy? Thymic atrophy means the thymus, which is the male lymphoid organ where the immune cells are kept and activate when the pathogen come. So at the early age, the thymus gland is uh, quite large uh, and the uh, re release of this uh, T cells which uh, from the thymus is gradually high. So with the uh, young girls easily uh, tackle against the viruses. But as the age goes on, the thymus gland is gradually reduced. So uh, the T cells, thyroid T cell, T helper cells, which are not able to tackle those viruses. So there is high chance of getting infection in older ages. And here is interesting that is a ACE2, you see the in the diagram that uh, this SARS CoV 2 bind to the ACE2 in the plasma membrane to get infect in our uh, body, in our cells. But, and in uh, younger age, the ACE2 expression is high comparable to this uh, older ages. But uh, in older ages, as I, I told you, uh, that uh, the, the infection, uh, the other comorbidities like cardiovascular disease, diabetes, hypertension are high in aged persons. So due to these comorbidities, the ACU2 ACU2 expression is uh, ACU2 expression is le level high. So the older person, therefore, the older person is more prone to this COVID-19 infection. So. Uh, here I'm talking. So, what can we do? We take our healthy food because we in our daily routine, daily life, we do not ever about the, our uh, daily foods. So, we uh, conscious about the foods. Uh, there, therefore, we can boost our immune system. So here is just uh, giving a, uh, in this diagram. You just see we take. We need to take the plant, uh, plenty of fruits of like uh, orange, uh, like any other kinds of then vegetables. So here I am uh, just uh, giving you the idea of the what is the micronutrients which are plays a um, critical role to boost our immune system. So as you see that the vitamin A, as we all know that vitamin plays a essential roles in our body. The vitamin is a fat soluble vitamin which um, uh, important role in regulation of cellular and humoral response. So get, getting high vitamin A, we need to take uh, carrots, then broccoli, then eggs, uh, then vitamin B, C, is, it is also a water soluble compound and for getting the vitamin B, C, we need to take this banana and soybeans, white grains, vitamin C, so water soluble compound is involved in cellular function in both innate and adaptive immune system and vitamin C also acts as cofactor to activate the hydro hydrolase, uh, hydroxylase enzymes. Uh, and through this enzyme, there's a downregulated down protein, uh, protein synthesis, which is carnitine, which yeah, acts as a substrate to um, uh, trans, uh, pass the fatty acid to into the mitochondria. That way, the we get high uh, to uh, increase the metabolic energy. That that's in, so that our body can uh, tackle those infection. Then vitamin D is a fat soluble uh, compound played important function beyond those of calcium and bone uh, homeostasis 
which include the modulation of in innate and adaptive immune systems. Its act role in antimicrobial proteins is also in uh, induce the number of gut mi microbiota. So, and for um, we can take the vitamins from milk. And here is a uh, report. You see that there is a role of vitamin D in the prevention of coronavirus disease to 2019 infection and mortality. In the vitamin E, vitamin E is a potent antioxidant, has an ability to modulate the host immune function, especially in elderly person. Because uh, vitamin E also acts as an antioxidant, uh, so it just prevent the PUFA, that is polyunsaturated fatty acid, to get oxidized. So that's why they uh, maintain our membrane in proper way and make our body immune system get stronger. So here is the uh, it's a trace element, I mean, which are also essential for our body's immune system. That this uh, trace element as the pathogen infect in our body, uh, the T-cell receptor which get activated, which bind to the path, uh, this antigen and activate uh, our body's immune system like is uh, proliferate the cytokines and this gene in, uh, uh, inside come inside in our body through the G6 receptor which inhibits this SHP1 inhibit this TCR, this T-cell receptor. So that's the gene also plays a essential role to uh, maintain our body. Uh, and keep our body in uh, well manner. And the, and the magnesium, magnesium also acts as a cofactor in the, for the immune, uh, for the immune, immunoglobulin synthesis, which are immune cells of the body and plays a role in innate and as well as acquired immunity. And uh, you also, uh, we also know that magnesium also acts as a cofactor the, in the synthesis of DNA replication. So it's that way that magnesium also helps us a lot. So what uh, what can we can can do? So we can do a make he healthy lifestyle to avoid health complication, especially an elder person, as they are more susceptible to infection. Because no single food is super food, and no single nutrients is magic nutrient. So al uh, always try to maintain our food habit uh, to boost our immune system, and uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you for, for all. There's no questions. So thank you, uh, Mr. Roy, uh, for your nice presentation. So like uh, I, I, I am thanking you all of our uh, COVID warriors uh, for giving this uh, nice presentation. So like we have huge questions uh, from the Facebook as well as from the YouTube channels also. So due to the uh, lack of time, uh, so we are not able to uh, take all the questions. So and uh, but uh, we'll be answering uh, all the questions in our uh, respective groups also in Facebook page also. So we'll be answering the all the questions and thank you all uh, for this uh, participation now we are uh, ending this ending this session for today thank you very much